Um, Beyond that, you know, things have slowed down a lot because of this virus, so we don't have nearly so many announcements. Uh, does anybody have any other announcements that need to be made this morning? Anybody have any prayer requests? We'll move into prayer now. Pray for America. Yeah, please. Yes, absolutely. We're uh, in need of prayer for uh, there's a strong element of resistance to authority that's going on in our country, and that's a serious problem. And there was serious histories of um, crime and abuse of authority that uh, are not helping people to submit to authority. So there's, there's just all kinds of problems, lots of division, lots of anger. Uh, we need to be in prayer for our country, for sure. And we're going to be hearing from God's Word about this issue. So it might, might be a little bit of a heavier sermon today, so enjoy the weather afterwards. We are going to be going back to Philippians, uh, which has some words of encouragement in the, the following week. But yeah, we'll pray for the country. Any other? Yes. I'd like people to remember um, basically my family. They go be a year. They won't be in a year anniversary of my nephew being killed. And. Um, Is that today? Is the end? So Kathy's asking prayer for her family. Wednesday will mark a one-year anniversary of the passing of a loved nephew, which is hard on everybody as it becomes raw again, that memory. Other prayer requests? All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, thanking you for this opportunity for fellowship and worship that you grant us this day. Lord, we thank you as well for the beautiful weather, reminding us, Lord, of your goodness and kindness. God, we do pray for Kathy and her family as they uh, remember the lost nephew and ask, Lord, that you be with them in their mourning and in their remembrance as a great and deep source of comfort. We pray, Lord, for our country, the sharp anger that is going on, the uh, attacks upon authority and servicemen that uh, I know you are not at all pleased with, and Lord, uh, our country is just turning against authority, and by extension, they're turning against you, and that puts uh, peace-loving citizens like ourselves in a dangerous place. So Lord, we do pray that you would help people to um, turn to you and uh, do as they should. Lord, we want to see people become worshipers of God in a right relationship with Jesus, um, we want, Lord, you indwelling all of mankind, uh, solving this issue that is within man that um, balks at your commandments and fights against authority. Lord, we need your help. Our country needs you. Lord, uh, be with us now as we turn and worship and singing and praise to you. Help us, Lord, to have um, hearts and minds set and attuned to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the one we'll start with, and I guess we'll do all four of them. Four songs. I mean, today, I guess you've been doing not that many. But uh, the first one is called What a Mighty God We Serve. Yeah. You got it. Give your hand out there. The words, anyhow. What a mighty God we serve.
Let's pray before we get into God's word. Dear God, we do lift our hearts before you this morning as a token of our love. And Lord, um, a big, big part of worshiping you is obeying you. And this morning, we will hear from your word, your expectations for us, and how we are to um, conduct ourselves in relation to human government. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to take these words seriously and look at them as a matter of worship toward you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, as I, as I said earlier, I'm taking a brief detour from Philippians this week, uh, intending just one, one message as a detour from Philippians, and it's to talk about an ongoing issue in this country. And uh, when I first began preparing for the message on Wednesday, I wondered to myself, will there still be rioting and looting come Sunday, or will there not be? Unfortunately, there still is, even now. It's been going on for over a week. We're seeing a lot of um, social unrest in our country. Uh, Back-to-back serious issues. We had the coronavirus, and now we have uh, a lot of social unrest, perhaps related. Um, Wonder a little bit about the health of everybody sitting at home watching the news. That can be not healthy. But I think that uh, with the serious problem of the social unrest that we're facing, there is a culture problem that has been a deep-seated thing in America for many years now and is, in fact, very ungodly. The problem is the increasing resistance to authority that is taking place in our country. Law and order, they're not respected public servants physically and verbally attacked. Some are looting and rioting. Some are openly advocating anarchy and defunding um, law and order services. Still more are sharing hateful and derogatory statements toward officers and other people serving in positions of government. This is normal in our country. You can read about it on any forum. You can see the disrespect toward government officials. You can see on TV people getting in the face of police officers, people resisting arrest. You can see it all the time. You can see it in this resistance to authority um, in smaller expressions from children toward parents, children toward their teachers. It's simply all over the place. It's a deep, common thing in our culture. Well, what insight does God's word provide into this issue? Uh, God has not been silent on anything pertaining to life and godliness. We have everything that we need from his word to obey him and live the lives he's called us to. And he's given us instruction in his word about government and man's relationship to it and to authority. And he spoke about it in Romans chapter 13. In verses 1 to 7, and we're going to read about these this morning and be looking to obey God in something that can be challenging. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Will you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain." For he is the servant of God, an avenger, who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. So before I start talking about these verses, I want to mention something, and I usually 
don't do this sort of thing uh, because I think that words need to be weighed according to their value and, and um, looked at intelligently and discerningly and, and looked at with God's word. So I don't usually talk about my credentials, uh, but I want to mention that these words, I spent uh, nigh on a semester in a class on Romans, looking at them in Greek and creating my own translation of what the word said and forming a big paper, which I put in front of my professor and had to defend on multiple occasions. I looked on the internet at all kinds of different views about uh, who's the authority that's in mind, who's not the authority that is in mind. And so I know what I'm talking about. And I know that you can look online and you will see people who will say, that's not what this is really about. I have a paper if you think that I'm wrong and I would like to share it with you. You might be wondering why I would take a whole semester on this and why I would take such interest in it, why I would choose to talk about this this morning. Uh, a big part of my interest stems from the fact that I've been a missionary to China, both my wife and I, and Chinese authority prohibits you from preaching the gospel. It is illegal to share the gospel in China. And so, naturally, I needed to think about before going there even, how can I do Romans 13 and also preach the gospel in China? Are those two things incompatible? I needed to study it. And my uh, interest in the verses haven't changed since then because the situation hasn't really changed since then. When I went to China, I was going to a place where there were authorities who didn't honor God. They didn't believe God. They made laws that were against God. Well, in America, we have certain authorities who do not honor God, who do not obey God, and who make laws that do not honor God. It's really not that different here, it turns out. But we have, an even, we have a, a culture, too, here in America where we just have an easy time saying no to what authorities tell us to do. We are very comfortable with that, uh, so frighteningly comfortable, some of us, that looting a store, rioting, not a big deal. So I'm very interested in these verses, uh, and I've studied them hard, and I've heard all kinds of contrary opinions out there, and I have much to say about them, but I'm, I'm not going to get into the contrary opinions. I have a paper for that if you want to read it. So that out of the way, here's what God says about authority, uh, secular governing authority specifically, and our response to that authority as believers. First, verse 1, Paul says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. That's the main message of the verses. That's the main application. The other stuff is uh, just talking about what that means and why you should be doing it. Paul usually, when he gives instructions, he says words like saint or brethren or brothers or beloved. This is only the uh, second time in the New Testament that it says let every person. The other place is in James where it says let every person. And that's not to say when it says brothers that it's not also applying to unbelievers and that sort of thing. But it does draw our attention. Uh, he does not use this phrase often. And the reason he's using this phrase is to point out that there is no exception. You know, he, he wants you to know these Christians who he's addressing as brethren. This applies to all of you. you know, it doesn't matter if you are an authority yourself or not an authority. It doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter if you are uh, a pastor or a deacon or a lay person or whatever, you know, Jew, Gentile, Russian, Chinese, um, cop, not cop, everybody, everybody must be in subjection to authority. Even presidents, even kings must be in subjection to authority, every person. So the command, every person, every human being, the authorities that we are supposed to be in subject to are secular governing authorities. Um, like those of the United States of America. It's, some will say it's about spiritual authorities. The main reason to reject that is because they bear the sword. Uh, that, that's an unsubtle way of saying they can cut your head off if you disobey what they are saying. And they are authorized God, by God uh, to punish those who are in the wrong. <laughs> if pastor wields a, church, uh, wields a sword against you, he's in the wrong. But if government... Uh, does and somebody's killed somebody, that's their prerogative. They are God's avengers against those 
who do wrong. So it's about secular authorities. Everybody needs to be in subjection to them. Now, the big question, and this is the one that uh, allows me, somebody like me, to go to China and break their laws against um, preaching the gospel, is what does it then mean to be subject to these authorities? What does that word mean? Subject in Greek is hupo tasso, and that means stand under. Hupo, under, tasso, stand. Resist is anti tasso, anti against tasso, stand. So subject to means to stand under, you are underneath them. Anti tasso means that you are standing against them. To be subject to one is essentially following the leadership of that individual, honoring them and not challenging them as an opponent. The opposite of that is antitasso, to stand against, resist. Uh, you can see examples of this on television now. When you look at uh, somebody getting in the face of a, a, an authority figure, yelling at them, that sort of thing, you're standing against them, opposed to their government and what they are wanting to do. That's antitasso. So the core command and application of these verses is this. Every person, without exception, should stand under governing authorities. People should not stand opposed to governing authorities. And the command is just primarily about how you position yourself in relation to government. Are you seeking to honor and uphold the government which God has appointed and the governors which God has put in place? Is your posture toward them respectful? Are you in general trying to follow and listen to what they tell you to do? Are you letting the government do its job of governing and trying to be a willing participant in that institution of government which God has put on the earth? Or at the opposite end of that, the strong examples we see concentrated today look like looting and rioting, um, intentional efforts to attack the government and uh, retaliate against their law. It looks like getting up in the face of an officer to intimidate them and show them a lack of respect. It looks like getting on Twitter and advocating that people fight against the government and burn things down. It looks like swearing at and giving death threats to government officials. That's anti-Tasso. Those are strong and obvious forms of resisting authority. And fortunately, no one here is going to go shouting at officers and looting stores. So I'm not I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. You now know the difference. You now know basically what subjection looks like and basically what anti-tasso looks like. But that kind of big level resistance, I'm not at all worried that I'm going to see anything like that amongst mature believers. That's, that's a big thing. But there's all kinds of smaller examples that we might encounter every day, maybe in ourselves, in our hearts, maybe in our loved ones, in our family, maybe with those we are working alongside of that could be issues that we might, might face uh, with how we relate to government. One slight subject change, but it's still very similar. Uh, kids are often being taught today through media, through all kinds of sources, to disrespect authority. It's, it's a common story thread in many movies and books and TV shows that kids are exposed to, and music that they listen to is to disrespect authority. Uh, I love Disney stuff. It's some of the most wholesome stuff you're going to find, but a common theme of even light Disney stuff is that. It's just everywhere. And I'm not saying turn off the Disney movies and never watch TV again. But we need to be aware that there is a con concerted effort out there for many people toward children to teach them not to respect authorities. And so when we interact with children, we don't want to reinforce that message. We want to counter that message. It's fine to let your child watch that sort of stuff. They're going to be exposed to it anyway, eventually. So in a certain sense, we need to teach them rather and point out to them when things come up that are not good. Well, then um, parents are also taught to tolerate resistance and that parenting um, good parenting basically involves letting your child do whatever they want to do. Um, I've seen before uh, boys like five years old running around in a dress and, and parents and other people um, bragging about, you know, I am learning from my child about gender identity and this sort of stuff. Parents are abdicating their role as authorities in their children's life 
And that also will indirectly contribute to this problem of just resistance to authority. Well, then these kids, they go on and they resist the authority of their school teachers. Teachers have their hands completely tied in what they can do about it. And then they go and tell the parents who should be able to do something about it, that the child is not obeying authority, this problem, that problem. And then the parents yell at the teacher because the parents also have this authority problem. And now we know where the the kids got the authority problem. It was from the parents. Then when they grow up, um, they become employees who are resistant to their bosses and they won't do what their boss says. And only when the boss is around will they do according to what their boss wants them to do. And then they watch television where all day, you can see even our authorities attacking one another. Yeah, even our authorities don't respect authority. They just yell at each other and hate each other, and there's no honor, there's no respect amongst them. So by the time uh, most Americans <laughs> reach my age, well before they reach my age, they're well accustomed to resisting authority. It's in their nature. The bigger and more frightening stuff of looting, rioting, it ought not to surprise us when it's so deep in our culture. But though it's tolerated and it's a daily occurrence, you don't need to tell me to tell you that it really is um, and can become a very serious problem. We have seen the past week how this can develop into a very serious problem when allowed to go on and on and on. You've seen the things burning. So again, you don't need me to tell you not to riot, not to loot a store, uh, but we do need to talk about this authority problem because it's everywhere. And it's an even bigger problem than you might think. Uh, This week has been even worse than you might think. Why should everyone be subject to the governing authorities? What does the Bible say? Those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you then have no fear of the one who is an authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. Also, there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So why is it so bad? Because those who have authority have been appointed to that position by God. And when you resist the government, you resist what God has appointed, and by extension, you resist God himself. So what you are seeing around you, from the worst examples of looting to the smaller examples of disrespecting teachers and even smaller stuff of on Twitter saying something you shouldn't say about somebody else, all of this is actively a rebellion against God. Our pledge of allegiance, one nation under God, we are not under God when we choose to not submit to the authorities he has put in place to serve him. Nor can we ever be one nation until it's in submission, unified, under the government God has put in place. Those who make themselves an adversary of God's government make themselves an adversary of what God has appointed. And worse still, they'll incur judgment from God for doing that. And we act as if that's fine, and it's not fine. So you probably hearing this and wondering, okay then, how can you go to China and break China's laws? against preaching the gospel. First of all, reminder, uh, subject means stand under and resist means stand opposed. Being subject to doesn't mean obey. It doesn't mean obey. Often being subject to one means that you need to obey them when you can, but it's not the same word as obey. Akuo is the Greek word for obey. He didn't use that word here. You can actually be subject to one and disobey that one. We have biblical examples of that. The early church had to do that a lot. Paul wrote Romans, where he says this here, be subject to the government, and we're reading through Philippians, which Paul wrote while he was in jail, because he disobeyed the government and was preaching the gospel. He was still subject to the government, but he was disobeying them. It's not actually hard at all to do that. An example uh, could be that the government tells everybody that they must wear a face mask. And so then they put on their face mask to go out and riot. (laughs) Yeah, they're obeying that law to wear the face mask, but are they really being in subjection and upholding and honoring those who are in government authority? No, not at all. The government could also uh, give an injunction to say, stop worshiping 
in church. And a person can say respectfully, I do not believe you are acting according to the job God has given you to do. I won't fight you, but neither will I obey this instruction because it's ungodly. And that's not your job. Your job is to punish wrongdoing and approve of what is righteous. So there you go. And you can do it respectfully and you can disobey when asked to do something that is against God's word. And that's because the job of a ruler is to approve what is good and be a terror to what is bad, just as it says. Because their job is to approve of your good conduct and punish people for doing evil, when an authority orders something bad or terrorizes something good or fails to punish evil, they're acting outside of their job description. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're still a ruler, but they are not ruling. You should still respect the office. You should still, to the degree you can, be in subjection. But you don't have to obey a law that promotes bad conduct. This was the way of Paul, and this was the way of the early church. The early church got instructed that they needed to worship Caesar. They needed to take part in these um, pagan festivals and holidays. And the early church said, nope. We're not going to do that. But they also didn't get up pitchforks and riot against the, the church either. What ended up happening was they took over the government. They became more and more intelligent in their argumentation. And eventually they converted the emperor himself. And Christianity became the belief throughout the land. That didn't happen through them attacking and fighting the government. It happened with them disobeying the government, but in subjection to that government. Uh, one more thing, and then I'm going to get to what we as mature believers can do in regard to these uh, verses. One more thing. It says that expressions of being subjection, one of them is that we're to pay taxes. And taxes are meant to help financially support authorities as they perform their role of approving what is good and punishing what is evil. They need the finances to help them do that job so they're not out working another job unable to do that, basically, is what it means. Now, you might hear that and think, as I have thought, um, but that's not always what taxes are used for. Sometimes taxes can be used for things like abortion. Sometimes they can be used for things like gender swaps. Sometimes they can be used for private jets that are bought on the side. What about that? You know, I don't like that my taxes are being used for that. I, I personally don't. I'm sure you don't either. Do we still need to pay taxes? Well, uh, it says everybody must be in subjection, and it says we must pay to all what is owed them. And mostly, you should know that Jesus paid taxes. And his taxes were used to help buy the cross and nails that he was crucified with. His taxes helped pave the road that he carried that cross on. It paid the salary of the soldiers who beat him and tortured him on the cross. And Jesus knew this would happen. It was not an accident that he paid the taxes anyway. All right, so I'll go, go over the basic teaching in a nutshell, then we're going to do a bunch of applications for us as mature believers. Basic teaching, the instruction of Romans 13, is simply that everyone without exception should be subject to the governing authorities. Being subject means to stand under them instead of being an opponent toward them. We should obey them, but it doesn't first mean obey. So sometimes you can disobey if they're not acting according to their job. But we shouldn't disobey in an aggressive way. And yes, we do have to pay taxes. Sorry about that. All right, so now let's talk about what we as Christians ought to be doing in today's environment in light of that. First, we should make sure that we're doing this, you know, just ourselves first of all. Make sure that we're doing this, that we are standing under the government, not standing opposed to the government. We should be paying our taxes. We should be supporting police and armed forces, supporting the executive branch, legislative branch, judicial branch, upholding the, the Constitution, obeying laws when they don't conflict with higher authorities, especially obeying laws that uh, follow God's instruction. We should not stand alongside those who are working to tear things down. Second, the Bible teaches us that we are to pray for our leaders, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. 
This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We as mature Christians should pray for our leaders so that we can lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. That's their job. Uh, They do that by punishing wrongdoing and approving what is right. They're God's servants for that cause. So essentially we pray that they live in job so that we can live in peace and live godly, quiet lives. We pray that law be upheld. We pray that they punish wrong and reward and approve what is right. As Romans 13 says, that's their very job. So it's right and good to pray that government would be strict on crime and kind on righteousness. Government authorities punishing wrongdoing, approving what is godly, is what enables us to live godly lives. We should also pray for their salvation. It says God desires that everyone be saved. God wants everyone to be saved. And if a ruler is going to do their job well, and if their job is they're a servant of God who punishes wrongdoing, which God has described what is wrongdoing and approves what is righteous, if they're going to do a good job of that, then it's going to help and maybe even be entirely necessary that they be a believer uh, because if they're appointed to God's role as a servant against wrongdoing, but they don't believe in God, they don't believe they're a servant of him, and they have a totally different definition of what's wrong and right, how are they going to do that job well? So we need to pray for our leaders because they'll never rule the way God wants them to until they know him and until they know what their job is. Third, we should make efforts to counter the culture of resistance. This can be done with your children and being careful what they're exposed to and being aware when they have been taught something that's saying to resist authorities and uh, giving some counter input into that. It can be done when we interact with other people's children uh, and and reinforce with children that they should be following and listening to their parents. We should be aware of uh, what's going on in social media and how we conduct ourselves on there. A lot of people can have a different persona on social media than they do in real life. They can say things that they're comfortable with um, on a forum that they would never say to a person in real life. We should take inventory of the kinds of things we say there and be sure that they're not contributing to resistance. We should be ready to inform people that resisting authority leads to less peace and more crime, not better things. Even if they don't like it, even if they don't stop, even if they don't listen to that message, it's still obviously clear that resisting authority doesn't improve things. Fourth, one more thing, being that we are in a constitutional democracy, we have some unique privileges. One privilege is that the Constitution is the highest authority in our land. Uh, The Constitution is the overarching authority uh, going over our president, going over our Congress, over our Senate, over everything else. And so if there is some kind of conflict in what's being instructed toward you, you know, and again, if somebody wants to say to you, here's a restriction on your religious freedom, you don't necessarily have to obey that because the Constitution, which is over them and their rules, says you have freedom of religion. Also, constitutional democracy, that means we get to vote. We get to vote. And so you should vote for the people who actually know what the role of government is and work to fulfill that role. It seems as though the motivating factor for so many people at the ballot box is money. You know, that seems to be what they're talking about all the time and concerned about. Certain people will help give me money through social programs. Certain other people will defund those or tax less and give me money because of that. The role of government is punishing wrongdoing and approving what is righteous. So foremost in our mind needs to be, who's going to do that? Who's, who's, who's going to obey God in this matter? That's, that's who we most want to be directing our votes toward and our prayers toward. And certainly money has a part in that. You know, I'm not saying don't consider those sorts of things. But don't let it be, don't let it be. Uh, the entire guiding rule in how you vote. You want people who will uphold God's government. And there's plenty of people who might help you financially who won't do that. 
All right, so lots to think about there. Again, kind of a heavier message. We'll get to uh, Philippians 4 in, I think, two weeks, which we'll talk about thinking joyful and rejoicing thoughts. Uh, and I'm looking forward to giving you that from God's Word, too, because we certainly need that. Roman, or Philippians 4, check it out before we get there. So if you have any questions or thoughts or uh, concerns, feel free to chat with me about them afterwards. I'm happy to talk more. Let's pray. Dear God, uh, thank you for these words, and I pray, Lord, that we would all spend some time wrestling with them ourselves and looking at our life and considering, Lord, how we can help people um, to operate under authority as they ought to. And Lord, help us to pray for those who are in authority that they would do the right thing. You know, there certainly are people in authority who have abused it and done ugly things. And Lord, they will have to give an account for what they have done, and they have broken and not followed authority themselves by doing that. That is not good, too. Lord, we pray for our country. Uh, we need um, pounds and pounds of love put upon us. We need love for brethren. We need love for each other. We need to no longer be shouting in anger toward those we disagree with. Lord, we do need good governance and, and, and a culture that doesn't just resist that and fight against that and advocate anarchy. That's, that's not good for anybody. Lord, and we, do need, we do need more righteous leaders and, and public servants. Lord, may it just not be that there be individuals who take advantage of their office to um, hurt other people with that. That's not good either. Lord, most of all, in all of these areas and problems, we just need you. We need people to turn to you, follow you, obey you, love you. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.